Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our last webinar that was supposed to be streamed, but <laughs> will be uploaded later on the social media. Uh, this webinar is organized by Green European Foundation with the support of CDN and the financial support of European Parliament to Green European Foundation and support of European Youth Foundation of Council of Europe to CDN. Today, our guest is Susanna Pavelkova that will talk to us about public speaking. She's a member of Czech Young Greens, Mladí Zelení, and she was also co-spokesperson of FYG. Susanna, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Masha, for introducing me. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you who are with us uh, here tonight and also to everyone who will be watching uh, the recording uh, later. I see some familiar names among the attendees and also some uh, names uh, that I don't know yet. So I'm really happy to get the chance to know you through this webinar. I would maybe ask uh, Elena if it's possible to uh, share the presentation and then uh, we can get started. So yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to be here tonight. I'm very pleased to be here tonight and to do something together with uh, CDN, which I think is uh, an absolutely wonderful organization. And uh, throughout the years, this has really been the place where many people and, and many women and many queer people could get uh, inspired and empowered. So thank you very much for also organizing uh, this series. Uh, tonight's webinar is about public speaking. And from what I get to hear, it will be your last uh, public webinar. Uh, and it should focus a little bit more on developing some uh, practical skills that you can uh, make use of to uh, smash patriarchy and uh, change the world. Uh, maybe a couple of words about myself. As Masha already said, uh, my name is Susanna. I, uh, I am a member of the Czech and Greens. And between 2017 and 2019, I was in the leadership of the Federation of Young European Greens, uh, FYEG, which is a CDN sister organization. And it's uh, focusing a little bit more on bringing young people um, into politics and sort of turning activists into progressive uh, politicians. So in 2019, uh, we did the European elections campaign. Uh, and together with my uh, then uh, co-spokesperson, Katri, we did quite uh, a lot of uh, public speaking uh, during that time. So I'm also happy to share uh, some of the thoughts. Of course, uh, those tips are based on my experience and uh, I'm always curious to hear what other people think, what are other people's uh, strategies or, or um, you know, some practical advices. So I'll be also very happy to hear uh, more from you in the second part of the webinar. And now I would ask for the second slide. Yes, so what is this presentation going to be about? So firstly, we will discuss briefly uh, what is actually the challenge uh, when you're doing public speaking as uh, a woman or a gender queer person, a queer person. Uh, and then we will walk really uh, through some practical steps of uh, public speaking. So how to prepare a speech from the scratch, uh, how to write a speech, uh, how to rewrite it, how to train it, how to deliver it, which is probably, uh, which can be the most challenging part and what to do maybe after the speech. And then we will move on to uh, the exercise. Uh, maybe just a note on the picture. Uh, the picture which you can see is uh, from the opening of our European elections campaign in 2019. We were in uh, Madrid and we had a lot of uh, the young candidates uh, there with us. So you could see in the picture uh, Micha Blos, who later became um, MEP and Kim van Sparenta, who also became a MEP and many other wonderful people who are doing uh, really awesome stuff. Um, and I really like to think back to this event because it always reminds me how uh, really speeches have the power to change minds and hearts of people and inspire them and empower them and really to change the world because after this, uh, after this um, campaign event we ran an awesome campaign and uh, the Greens made really quite important victories in many countries around Europe. So I really like to think back to this moment because it really felt uh, pretty empowering. 
So yeah, what are some of the challenges of uh, public speaking as, as women and uh, queers? I will maybe start with uh, a bit of a personal story. Uh, it may not look like that, but I'm actually quite uh, an introverted person. And I used to be like a very shy person. So I was not uh, born a speaker. And uh, there was this uh, situation, I was uh, about 17. And I was really not speaking much, even in my friend circles. And then a person came up to me and asked me like, do you ever speak at all? So this was the level of me not speaking in public uh, when I was 17. And if by that time you had told me that at some point I will become the co-spokesperson of a youth organization, it, like I could not have imagined that. Um, and I don't know how things started to change or what was, you know, I cannot tell you like this one single moment where everything flipped around and suddenly I could speak in public. But I guess I became the co-spokesperson uh, for two reasons. Um, I was passionate about certain topics. For me, it was mainly um, refugees and uh, migration, because I really think we need some kind of more uh, human migration policy in Europe. Uh, and the second uh, thing was that I had people around me who were supporting me. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Yeah, this next slide is important because what you can see in the picture, it's actually me uh, speaking, I think, for the first time at a protest, which was also about refugees. It was in 2015. And uh, the person who is standing next to me is uh, Tomasz Kremen. And he was, um, he was the co-spokesperson of Czech and Greens by the time. And he was the person who told me to come to this event. He was the person who told me who told me uh, to speak at this event. And he was the person who you know, is standing there next to me and uh, he's holding my loudspeaker so that I, that I can just focus on the speaking. Uh, and I think without him, I wouldn't have dared uh, to go there and uh, give a speech. And so I think this last point of uh, having a community and having someone around you who is going to support you, especially in the be beginning, uh, it's really crucial. Um, maybe a bit more on, on the challenges. I think the big challenge is that um, as women and as queer people, we are traditionally really not meant to be in public spaces. And that's especially the case in uh, Eastern Europe. So nobody is sort of expecting us to, you know, grab the microphone and have an opinion and have the courage to say it publicly. And in some countries, this might be even dangerous, you know, coming out publicly as a queer person might also be a matter of safety. Um, having a strong opinion as a woman might mean that you will receive a lot of backlash, a lot of hate speech on social media. So there are also quite uh, severe considerations which everyone uh, should make bef before speaking publicly. Um, but also because nobody's ex expecting us uh, to speak in public, and we don't see many examples of uh, public speakers uh, who, are, who are women and who are queers, we may not be expecting this from ourselves either. So it's the two, it's the systemic barriers. And it, as a result of that, we have our own internalized barriers. And we may think we might not be good enough to be public speakers. But I think it's always important to remind ourselves in those moments that you know it is public space and it does belong to us as much as it belongs to all other groups in society. So this space is also ours and we have the right to reclaim it. And I would even say we have sometimes the obligation to reclaim it because of all the work which others did before us, but also out of solidarity with the generation that will come after us. So yeah, how do we do this when it comes to really uh, public speaking? Let's move to the next slide. Yes, so uh, we will now go through really the, the process of uh, preparing a speech and delivering a speech quite a bit in detail. I have tried to be really um, very specific in giving like very, very concrete uh, tips. Uh, but again, these tips are based on my personal experience and you know, everyone is different and some of them might not uh, work for you personally. So just take whatever works and you know, throw away whatever is um, is not working for you. Uh, when preparing for a speech from the very beginning, 
I think the rule number one is that you really um, need to take quite a lot of time. And this is something which should not be uh, somehow underestimated. Like you, especially if this is the first time you're um, preparing a speech or you will be giving a speech, it's gonna take you a lot of time to train it and it's gonna, gonna take you a lot of time to rewrite it and to adjust it so that you feel really comfortable uh, with, uh, with giving it. Uh, about the topic, uh, there might be different situations. So there might be situations where you are free to choose the topic that you want to speak about. There might be situations where you're sort of bound by the nature of the event that you're taking part, if, part at what the topic will be about. Uh, so for example, if you're going to a protest, which is about um, the situation about abortion laws in Poland, it's quite clear what the topic is. Then again, if you're going to, let's say, a general assembly of another youth organization, I think it might be also quite interesting uh, in terms of how do you, what do you want to be the message and how do you want to bring it across? And it gives you maybe a little bit more creativity. So I think it's also interesting to sort of really think about um, you know, how free am I in, in choosing the topic? Uh, about the audience, I think that's also one of the first considerations that you should make when preparing a speech. Uh, so of course, uh, if you're giving if you're giving a speech at a protest, there is going to be quite a broad audience, but maybe there might be some specific group uh, that you want to inspire with your speech. And I would say for us as youth organizations, mainly we want to speak with young people. So we don't need to be concerned that much that maybe some, you know, other groups might not be very um, inspired or delighted by what we're saying because they are not our target audience. So I think we don't need to also hesitate to be quite sharp in our speech and to really target it to who we want to uh, inspire with our words. Uh, I think it's also always interesting to think about the context. So what is, for example, happening right now politically um, in the country? Uh, what is happening politically in Europe uh, or globally? I think it, it can also sort of, it's interesting when you can put your speech in some kind of a broader uh, societal development. Uh, I think also one of the first considerations that you always need to make is obviously how much time do you have? Uh, and I think this is also important because you know, you don't want to get stressed uh, by getting interrupted by the organizers in the middle of your speech, and then you don't bring your point across, and it's it's just, you know, it, it's sad for you uh, that you don't get enough time. Uh, so I think that's also something uh, which is important to consider. Um, it's also very good to know some basic technicalities ahead. So, for example, as you can see in the picture, uh, I was at a um, General Assembly of uh, Greener Jugend, which is the German Young Greens. And so I was, uh, the setting was that there were some tables and some chairs. And so I could have decided to sit on those chairs, but it actually would not really fit to my speech, which was about feminism. And it was like a very outright speech. And so it, it would, it just would not, I wouldn't be able to, you know, bring it forward by sitting on a chair. So it's also quite good to, to think about those aspects. Um, in some places, you might have some kind of a speaker's pult and you might be able to put your notes on the speaker's pult. In some places, you will have the microphone on like uh, a stand, so you don't need to hold it in your hand. And it's also something to consider because if you have your notes in one hand and your microphone in the other, you won't have you know, that much uh, possibility to somehow gesticulate with your hands. So those are all like uh, small things, but they can also, again, reduce the level of uh, stress that you might be experiencing. Uh, if you have time, I think it's always super nice to seek inspiration from other people. Uh, I like to look at uh, how progressive politicians do their speeches. And then, uh, and I think this is again quite key, uh, when you're preparing the speech, I think it's always helpful to start from developing um, some key aims and some key messages. So what do you want to achieve with your speech? And like, what is this one thing that everyone should remember when uh, they leave home? What is this one thing that you want them to bring home with, uh, with them? And I think that can really help you to sort of target the speech much more uh, and also not to sort of, you know, write something super long, which will not uh, in the end be very comprehensible. So that, that's the preparation part. 
If we then move on to uh, the next slide, which is about writing. Um, yeah, so writing a speech for me, uh, and again, this might be different for different people. For me, writing a speech was always about uh, how do I want to open it and how do I want to finish it? And I always felt like it's really important to be strong in those two parts. And whatever happens in the middle, it's gonna be fine, but those two parts should be really uh, well developed. And I should be very clear in, in what I'm doing in those two parts. Uh, so for opening, it's, you know, it, that's the moment where you need to grab your audience's attention. So it might be quite nice to start with a story, uh, especially if it's a personal story, uh, to start with a quote, uh, with an anecdote, uh, with a reference to some current political development or to, for example, relate to, to uh, say some une something unexpected. So for example, some kind of shocking, to give some shocking number, to give a um, rather shocking statement. So for example, let's say, you know, this number of queer people get killed as a result of homophobic violence in this country each year. And like, bam, there you have it, like everyone is listening to you. It's also quite good to have like some first punchlines and uh, punchline is something which we kind of, we were using this word with uh, Katri, my uh, co-spokesperson, quite a lot. Uh, and what we mean with that is some kind of a very strong uh, statement where you can expect that your, that your target group is going to cheer up and they're going to applaud and uh, people are going to like it. And the reason for this are two, like, first of all, it's um, quite nice to also catch people's attention but also, you know, if you get some nice applause in the beginning of your speech, it just feels really nice and it will kind of empower you to continue and it will also calm you down a little bit that this is going to um, end up fairly well. For uh, longer speeches, it can make sense to give some kind of a basic structure of your speech. And I don't mean this in this kind of academic sense, but rather, you know, it can be for example, saying just, uh, I'm going to tell you three reasons why this law is absolutely disgraceful and why it needs to change. And so people already know, okay, so there will be three points in the speech. So, and I think that helps uh, also people to follow what you're saying much better because you're already, they see that there is a certain logical structure that you're following. And um, like that way it, it helps them to actually listen to, to your argument. Um, yeah, then the ending of the speech. And I think the ending is sometimes, or maybe most of the times, uh, more important uh, than the opening. Um, because this is the place where, on one hand, your audience might be already a bit uh, tired, but it's also the place where you want to put your key messages in some kind of a key punchlines. And it should be like really sharp. And you should also somehow try to make um, some space for escalation. Um, so what do I mean with that? You should write a speech in a way that you can sort of increase its intensity towards the ending. I will maybe give you an example. This was uh, the speech which we gave, actually it was the closing speech which we gave with Katri at um, the campaign event. And these were basically the closing uh, paragraphs. And so we were kind of trying to encourage people to imagine how Europe would look like if the Greens um, and if the young Greens would get in the parliament. And it goes like this. If we win, then young people in Europe will have stable income, fair jobs, and a secured access to education and housing. If we win, women and genderqueer people will not need to be afraid of harassment, domestic violence, restrictive abortion laws, or walking on the streets at night. If we win, nobody will need to die in the Mediterranean. And if we win, we will start shutting down the dirty, dirty fossil industry, not in 2040, not in 2030, but right now. And so this way we kind of escalated the speech towards the final message. Um, and you know, after the end, uh, the audience sort of blew up and it was uh, super nice. Um, so yeah, uh, try to escalate towards the end if it's, if it's possible. Now maybe we can move on to the, to the next slide. 
Uh, yes, it's also good to make the middle sound somehow interesting. I think for me it was always uh, quite a challenge, but also very useful to try to keep things short. Um, it was also super helpful to find somehow what is the rhythm of my speech and to try to write things in a way which really fit my personal rhythm of speaking. And I think that's a matter of um, kind of practice. What has also been really useful for me is sort of create some, some repetitions and, and making lists. Uh, so one of the examples was, uh, I'm gonna give you three reasons why this is not acceptable. Reason number one, no, no, no. Reason number two, this and that. Reason number three, this, 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 this. Uh, or repetition, as, as I was just uh, kind of giving you the other example, if we win, then this and this and this. And if we win, then this, this, this. And I think the, um, the advantage of this is that, um, again, I think it makes it easier for people to listen to what you're saying, but also it makes it much easier for you because it's giving you like a very stable rhythm and it's also making it much easier to like memorize these parts of the speech because you know, like you're repeating, like the, the beginning is always the same. It's always the same repetition. Yeah, uh, the next point is planning and taking breaks. I'm really not so good at that as you can probably see uh, from how fast I speak right now. Uh, what was quite helpful for me was to also like write it in the speech to write in big letters like break so that you really take it. Um, and the breaks are obviously useful because they are breaks, but also, you know, this is the moment where you can get uh, quite um, a lot of applause because if you will just keep talking from the beginning till the end, uh, you don't give the audience even an opportunity to, you know, start cheering. Whereas if you do make a break, it's gonna be usually the point where people will like uh, try to cheer up a little bit. And especially if you do make a break after a very strong statement. So I would really uh, recommend taking breaks because that's also the moment where you get your applause and it's going to, you know, again, feel very nice and it's going to empower you for the rest of the, um, uh, the speech. Uh, what I found also quite interesting to, to try to use, and you can try to play around with that, is to use some uh, rhetorical tricks uh, from poetry. So there is this thing which is called anaphora, which is the repetition of the same beginning of, of, uh, of the sentence. So this was the, the thing with, if we win, then this happens, and if we win, then this happens. Um, or episoxis, so that, that means that you're kind of repeating the same word. So for example, you say, um, like, this law is scandalous, it's scandalous. So you kind of, you know, you strengthen uh, the ending of, of what you're saying. There might be some more. Uh, I'm not uh, so knowledgeable on poetry, but if you are, I think there might be actually quite a lot of inspiration to take, especially when it comes also to rhythm and um, and yes, yeah, some some other um, some other nice tips. We can maybe move on to the next slide. Yes, uh, the technicalities, which is maybe not something that people think about immediately when it comes to um, preparing a speech. But I, again, I found that also an interesting aspect uh, to think about. Uh, so basically, there is a choice that you need to make at some point, um, which might be also dependent from uh, what is the context or what is the, the space physically where you give the speech. So the question is, are you able to, or do you want to give the speech, have your speech on a paper? Do you want to have it for maybe in a tablet? Do you want to have it on your laptop? Or do you want to have it on uh, your phone? Of course, if you have a speaker's pult, you are definitely able to use a laptop or any of those. If you don't have a speaker's pult, it might be quite difficult, for example, to use the laptop. Um, if you're, I don't know, there might be also some people who, you know, just speak freely without, uh, without any paper. I absolutely admire that. And we will have a look at some of the examples uh, later. Um, but yeah, uh, so th these, these are the sort of um, decisions that you need to make. Maybe a few words also on the tablet and phone option. I actually liked a lot using my phone uh, and the reason is that 
with Katrick quite often we were changing the speech also quite a bit in the last minute, which I would not recommend, but uh, still sometimes we did simply because of time reasons and uh, because we're human and we sometimes, you know, uh, do not manage to do the things perfectly as we would like to do. And so it was quite useful that we're not we were not changing some stuff on paper and rewriting it and then scratching and then it's ugly and you just don't know where you are. Uh, but we had it quite clean uh, on uh, on our phones. And the way how I was using my phone um, when speaking was that uh, like it, what I do is that I keep scrolling through the speech and that allows me to have always the next paragraph where I'm speaking on the top of my um, screen, which is quite practical because then basically you always know where you are in the speech. And it doesn't happen to you that you're suddenly somehow not sure uh, which is the next line that you should be talking about, which I think can happen sometimes with paper. Of course, the, the downside of having a phone is that you should always make sure it's, it's fully charged. Of course, it can happen that someone calls you in the middle of the speech. That would be very um, stupid. Uh, it can also happen that if you're giving like a really bad speech, you will get a lot of notifications because a lot of people are tweeting. So that's uh, another downside. And then you should just, uh, you know, always make sure that you turn uh, your phone maybe in um, uh, in airplane mode or, or something like this. Yeah, uh, paper is, I think, almost always safe, especially if you know you have the final version of your speech. Uh, you can use paper basically anywhere. So that's kind of the safest option, though it is uh, less flexible than, than the others. Uh, now, maybe also about coloring and visual visualizing. I think it's also quite useful, um, for, especially when you're giving speeches in two. It can be quite useful to, you know, like color. We always, with Katri, we always colored the parts, like, I don't know, like in, in this example, um, me would be the green part and Katri would be the yellow part. And so that way it's very easy to follow which is your part and when do you need to start speaking. Uh, I think you can also really give yourself very, very nice advices on, um, you know, how you want to pronounce certain things, where you want to put, um, where you want to put emphasis. So, for example, in this speech, we wanted to put emphasis on um, basically young people continue to face the challenges that were caused by yesterday's man. And we knew that we want to put a lot of emphasis on the two last words, yesterday's man. So that's what we made in bold and that's what we, um, that's what we wrote in, 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 in big letters uh, so that we really focus on that part. Um, yes, another kind of trade-off that you need to make is uh, whether you want to write uh, the whole speech or whether you want to create bullet points. Uh, I personally like when my speeches are somehow really coherent uh, because then I feel like I can really deliver them much better. So I like to write them out um, with the first draft. But I also think that it can be quite good if, you, if I can then change it into bullet points uh, and kind of memorize certain parts and then just follow the bullet points because that allows me also to stay much more connected with the audience because then I'm not looking at my phone um, that much. So again, this might be a question of a personal preference. As said, there are people who manage to give a speech by just you know, having two or three points uh, in their head and um, they just go forward and it's a great speech. So it really depends also on your level of experience and um, yeah, wh whatever uh, you feel most comfortable with. Um, maybe one more word on rewriting. I think rewriting is really key, um, especially as you train the speech, you might realize that things which sound really super nice and super badass are just not working when you try to say them because some of the words, um, you know, do not come across as strong as you, as you want them or it just doesn't fit your mouth. So, uh, it's very nice if, if you have the opportunity to rewrite quite a bit. And I think that can also improve the speech quite a lot. So that would be it about the technicalities. We can maybe move to the next part, which is training uh, for the speech. Uh, I think when 
you know, whenever you are preparing to give a speech, it's always a good, uh, and it, I mean, it's a very basic uh, advice, right? But it's always good to read uh, your speech out loud and to do it a couple of times and then eventually uh, rewrite it. Uh, because as I said, some of the things might sound quite good on paper, but maybe you're not able to bring them across as strongly. It might be also interesting to try to play with different types of rhythm and different types of pronunciation of different words. So maybe some words, you know, some parts of the speech are meant quite sarcastically. So you really want to be able to bring this point across that it's, it's sarcasm or it's irony. Or other parts are you're really angry. So like, how do you, you know, how do you put the anger into words? Or how do you put like the passion or if it's, if it's, if it's about joy of something, about some victory, how do you put the joy into words? Uh, for that, it might be also interesting to find different parts of, um, of your voice and of your voice register. Um, so for me, it was quite interesting to do also some exercises on this specifically, because I realized it like my voice sounds quite differently if I, uh, if I didn't train it before, and if I just speak with the, with the kind of frontal parts of my mouth, then when I speak, when I create a voice from some kind of a back of my mouth, to, to put it very simply. So you can try to play a little bit also with that. And to, I think it's quite nice if you can find a you know, nice tone, which also sounds nice for your ears. Again, this is something which is going to give you quite a lot of confidence when you're actually on the stage. Um, again, when you train for the speech, it might be good to check the timing and eventually if you realize, you know, you don't fit within the timing that you're provided, then just rewrite it because if you're not, if you don't fit it, fit in while you're training, then probably you won't fit it you know, while you're delivering it and uh, you risk being interrupted and again, this is creating unnecessary stress. Um, yeah, it's quite good to recheck the technicalities with the organizers before you actually give the speech so that you're really sure like, okay, I have this type of microphone and this is where I'm standing, or I go right after this person has spoken so that you're sure really what is happening. And it might be quite nice if you have the opportunity and if it's really like a big speech to train uh, in a similar setting. So again, for our campaign event, uh, we invited the people who were uh, the young candidates and who were about to give the speech uh, that evening, we invite, invited them a couple of a couple of hours earlier and uh, we showed them the room, we showed them, we explained them how the event will go, uh, what will happen and so they could, they also had like an opportunity to you know take the mic and, and to kind of train it a little bit. It might be also good if you don't have the possibility to train in the venue, uh, you can train in front of a mirror or with the help of a video or in front of a friendly audience. And I think there again, it can be quite nice if you have a supportive community around you or a friend or a group of friends to really uh, try to train that with them uh, and also receive feedback. Yes, uh, exactly, next slide, great. Um, yes, uh, delivering a speech. So there is, this, um, there is this moment right before you deliver the speech and it's going to be like, you know, I don't know, an hour before you deliver the speech, you might be already a little bit nervous. And there are some ways how you can, um, how we can try to lower down this level of uh, being nervous. Uh, and I mean, one of the things, and again, it's very basic, very obvious, but still um, sometimes people don't follow this advice. And I know that sometimes myself, I didn't follow this advice. And that is arriving to the venue early. Like you really don't want to be, you know, stuck somewhere in public transport uh and then just run to the venue and already you are stressed and you just you didn't even start speaking yet so like try to get rid of unnecessary stress factors um it's very nice if it's possible to ask the organizers to do a microphone check uh, before the event especially if um you say let's say you are a speaker at a bigger event um if you can do that it's always useful if this is not possible, um, I think it can be also interesting to sort of see how you can test how your voice sign, sounds uh, in the room, because that also um, can lower the amount of stress quite a lot if you already heard yourself speaking in front of the others at least once before you go on the stage. So for example, what, what I like to do sometimes is just ask something very banal, like uh, can we open the windows or I don't know, something like this. 
uh, so that like already you spoke in front of the others. Uh, they already hurt you, you hurt yourself, you realize, oh, it's actually like, it's my voice and everything's fine and I, I can do this. And then you feel much more confident um, when you go on the stage. Um, yes, in case you are using uh, your phone or your tablet or your laptop, it's quite nice to be sure it's fully charged. I also have experienced moments where I realize it's not fully charged and then I had to charge it right before the speech. And again, it's quite stressful. You don't want it to, you know, um, run out of battery in the middle of your speech. The same with all your speech papers. Uh, just check that you have everything. It can be also quite nice to try to get your voice ready. Like some people do uh, a little bit, a bit of singing or just run again through the speech uh, so that they know that like it's not the first time they're opening their mouth uh, the moment uh, they get on the stage. Because after all, these are all somehow muscles, so you need to kind of warm them up a little bit and then they work the best. It's also nice if you can try to relax a little bit, although it might be quite um, challenging when you're just about to give a speech. Uh, and then this again really depends on whatever you feel like is your um, personal way of de-stressing. So some people listen to music or listen to some, I don't know, um, do some meditation or do some funny dance move or some stretching. I really like to put a lot of cold water in my face uh, or I like to tell myself that it's a theater, which is uh, helping quite a lot to, to put yourself in this, um, in this role or at least it's helping um, myself. So I'm, I'm happy to share this advice. And of course, uh, hugs from friends are also always nice and having your supportive community around you, it's uh, always nice. Yeah, so, and now you are about to give your speech. Um, yet, I mean, the first advice is just try not to panic. And the um, emphasis is on try, because maybe if it's the first time, you might panic a little bit, and that's also completely fine. Uh, you know, it's um, it happens to a lot of people. It's nice before you start to just before you start speaking just to breathe in uh sometimes people forget to do this um it, it, it's quite helpful and also to just you know take your space with um with, with your body like i mean th this is the space which is for you just you know you should reclaim it you should you should take it try not to rush uh, in the picture, what you can see is uh, me giving a speech at um, General Assembly of uh, Germany and Greens. It was another General Assembly than, than, the, than the previous one. And here they had a speaker's pult, which was quite nice. Uh, but the problem was I, I went to the speaker's pult and I started speaking. And then they started adjusting it because it was kind of a speaker's pult that you can move up and, and down. So it's like technologically really great. The problem is that when you start speaking and they start adjusting it, it, it again, it feels quite stressful. Uh, so it's also quite nice, you know, not to rush and just really like uh, set yourself up and uh, be calm. You don't need to kind of, you know, run with your speech immediately. Um, I also really like to bring a bit of water with me to the stage. Uh, I, because my mouth gets really dry and maybe it's the same for some of you. And I think it's also, the water is also a really nice way how to take a break. Although it can feel um, scary at first because it feels like, uh, you know, you're taking up so much time and uh, now everyone is a bit confused. Why is this person not talking? Why is he drinking? Um, uh, but actually the, the interesting effect is that like, this little space of calm that you create, if you have people who already kind of zoomed out from your speech, just by the fact that suddenly it's silent, this, this is going be, to be the thing which will bring them back to you because suddenly they will be like, okay, why is she not talking? And they will start looking at you again. So I think it has also this really interesting effect of, of how silence can actually increase uh, people's attention and, and bring them back to you. Um, so I would also really recommend taking water and uh, just take this break uh, for yourself. And if you have planned your speech uh, well ahead and you know that you're safe with the timing, uh, then you can also really take it because you know uh, you will manage 
even with the with the break for uh, drinking water. It's also always nice to try to find a friendly face or someone who's nodding or who, who's just laughing at you because it's you know it's going to again give you the confidence that that you're doing fine. You can also ask your friends before giving a speech to you know uh, like tell them or tell you where they will be standing so that you know where you can look uh, in case you don't feel um, very confident or you feel stressed. It's always nice to keep eye contact with the audience. Um, so I think it's quite nice if you, even if you prepared a really nice speech and it's, uh, you know, really well written, uh, I think it's really beneficial to sometimes not to look at the text, but really look at the people uh, because it's going to feel also really rewarding to see how you are touching them uh, and, and their hearts with what you're saying. And um, it's going to create a really nice energy. Uh, also, just don't hesitate to show how passionate you are about the topic and uh, kind of escalate it a little bit and really put yourself in, uh, in your speech. Um, because this is you and you believe in what you're saying. So like, do not hesitate with really bringing this forward. And whatever happens, this is also your moment and just really think about it, enjoy it. And um, I'm sure you will all shine. We can maybe move on to the next slide, which is a bit the cooling down after the speech. And I think the first thing that you should do is to simply celebrate and to really um, be happy about what you did and that you were brave and that you went on the stage and that you grabbed the microphone. It was not easy, uh, but there you are and uh, you made this experience. So that's really great. Uh, also, just don't run away from the venue or from the protest, because if you gave a really badass speech, which you for sure did, uh, then I mean the audience is there will be someone who will want to talk to you you know like it's always like that there will be at least one person who will come to you and who will tell you like okay this was really awesome and I want to join your organization or, or something like this um, and it's going to again be uh, really nice uh, also it's nice uh, what is also nice to do after speech is to check for social media uh, maybe if you had some really strong statements, they are already circling around on Twitter or they are maybe on uh, somewhere on Instagram or a lot of people do like, you know, uh, Insta stories. So there might be quite a lot of stuff that you can uh, reshare and that can really help you amplify your message. The same is, uh, is with videos. So if you have video recordings available, it's very good to ask for them. If they are very good quality, you can, uh, you know, use them again on social media to further spread the, spread the world, word. Um, but also you can use them for your own purpose to sort of uh, evaluate a little bit. How did the speech go? Uh, what would you change, etc. cetera? Uh, if no recording is uh, available, what you can also do and what I did also quite often is if you have worked really hard on a text, it's probably a very good text and probably Usually it works more or less already uh, also as a written text or with a few such adjustments, it's going to work as a written text. So it's something that you can also put on your social media together with a nice picture. And again, this is how you're going to amplify your message and bring it to more people than just the ones who were um, at a specific event. And of course, as with everything where you want to improve, it's very nice to evaluate after the speech and to think about, okay, what went well? What would I change in the future? Uh, what do I want to change in my preparation um, for next time? Yes, maybe one little bonus. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, community support is really crucial. I think when we speak about um, public speaking as, as women and as queer people, uh, because it can really help to overcome some of the challenges that, that we might be otherwise say, uh, facing. So I just wanted to like do also this, this bonus slide on how you can uh, support your friends in giving a speech, again, with some very concrete tips. Some of them might be, again, uh, maybe quite obvious, but I just wanted to list them out. Um, I think it's really nice uh, to proofread your friend's speeches and give them the possibility to, to train them uh, with you uh, and to sort of, you know, give them a bit of feedback uh, saying, well, this message is working really well for me, but with this message, I don't understand what you're actually saying, or I think it's not coming across really strongly, so maybe you can try to adjust it. Uh, 
it's also really nice if you can be there uh, before the speech uh, and encourage your friends or if you can also be there really especially when they are giving the speech if you can be the friendly face in the audience and create this nice atmosphere by clapping and cheering and that's something which what we did with Katri also quite a lot um, so for example when we were at the European Green Party uh, Council which was in Berlin and uh, this was the moment where the European Greens were deciding on their program for the, the election so it was quite important quite an important event for us and we really also wanted to bring a lot of like youth points across uh, and Katri had a speech and so we went through the speech uh, together before we trained it and then uh, like we knew exactly what will be the moments where she will make a break and when, when will there be a strong statement and when will we start clapping and when will we start cheering and sort of that allowed us to kind of create like a really nice atmosphere um, in the audience and you know the moment you have like a group of five people kind of clapping and cheering like the others are going to sort of follow quite naturally and that way you can really make a speech kind of you know you can increase the weight and the impact of the speech by just uh, supporting your friends friend who is actually speaking so I think that that's also quite a nice uh, strategy that, that you can use um, what's also quite good uh, especially if uh, you know you to, you want to amplify some of your messages as uh, as an organization is that you can try to prepare uh, maybe some of the tweets with the key messages already before and you can really plan them to be tweeted as the person speaks already with a picture so you just you can be like really quick as the person speaks you're, you're just kind of you know posting it uh, and that again kind of helps you to sort of amplify the message uh, much more on social media because maybe the other people attending the event will be immediately resharing uh, so yeah this is also the way how you can increase uh, the impact um, and of course, at the end, uh, give a big applause and uh, come hug your friend if they agree with hugging uh, after the speech um, and just create a nice, um, yeah, warm, warm feeling for them as well. So that would be it about supporting your friends and giving a speech. And that's almost it also for uh, this presentation. There is just one final reflection that I, that I wanted to share. So the tips that I gave you, it, it may also sound like this incredible amount of work that you need to do in order to make a good speech. And so I don't want to say that you necessarily need to follow all these steps in detail. I myself uh, did not follow many of my own advices uh, many times. Uh, I think if you, if you do follow some of the advices or if you find what is useful for you, um, I'm sure you can deliver uh, a good speech uh, but I think there is maybe like recently more and more I think um, there are some aspects which might be even more crucial than than the preparation and that's maybe the final reflection that I wanted to share uh, before we move on to the more uh, active part um, and I think that sometimes even more than the preparation what is maybe more uh, important is to focus on you in terms of being authentic and being passionate and connecting with the audience somehow also on this more uh, emotional level and then it doesn't matter if you make mistakes and you forget words and uh, you know uh, you blabber a little bit because if you're kind of able to show your passion and if, if there is this kind of inner kind of fire burning and people see it then they will just follow you um, and I know that all of you who are here today and everyone who will be watching this video later, uh, you are all definitely very passionate about the topic and you do care a lot about a certain topic, otherwise you wouldn't be attending this event. Um, and of course, it might seem scary to go speak uh, in front of other people, but I'm also sure that you are all brave enough to do this and you are all um, capable enough to do this. And what helps me always is really that the only thing which matters is being authentic and, and showing the passion and showing why I burn for this topic. And there is this whole movement around me who is there to support me. And there are all these generation of other activists who were here before me. And there are these generations of other activists uh, who will come after me. And so kind of we are here in this together and let's show this passion and let's show kind of the vision for the other world that we're uh, fighting for. 
So I really, uh, what I want to give you as the final reflection is really uh, connect with the passion and uh, just go for it and the others will uh, follow. And that's it for uh, the webinar part or for the public part. We can maybe now move on to the exercise. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, before we move, actually, we need to stop recording and we have yes. several questions in the chat. Yes. So maybe you answer them also. So we put them on Facebook. Uh, Maya is asking any tips for shaky voice, blushing and other stuff generally coming from being a shy person. Mm. Yeah, I think I blush a lot as well. And I, um, what I do is that I put a lot of cold water in my face uh, right before. Um, or like my, my face always gets uh, somehow heaten up a lot. So I know this really, really well. Um, yeah, uh, for shaky voice, I don't have a very clear advice. I would assume if you try to speak very slowly, which I'm also uh, not a very good example of, uh, but if you try that, I guess this could um, be helpful also, maybe a bit. Um, and maybe other other things coming from being a shy person. Mm, I really think maybe it would be helpful if you really have someone in the audience that you know very well and that you can relate to and who can sort of, you know, that then you don't need to be looking at this big audience and too many people, but maybe just focus on, on this one person uh, that you know and that, that you know that this person will be encouraging you. Uh, so these would be maybe my, my personal tips. I don't know if other people have a, other tips they would like to share or also other questions we can also maybe take yeah i i i think i'm not maybe entitled to give a like pro tip like you on this but let's say i have opinion because i also had a lot of uh, fears talking in public mm -hmm. and uh, then i think just at some point you need to realize that uh, what you're talking, you believe in it, right? Otherwise you would not be saying these things. And um, this should be something that you should think about when you want to have this confident um, speech. So yeah, just think about the core of what you're saying. It's truth, it's what you believe in. And uh, yeah, there is no reason for you to be nervous because you're saying truth yeah sounds good yeah yeah for me i think it goes in the same direction of like really connecting with with the passion and connecting with what you strongly as you said what you strongly believe in um i don't know if if that helps uh if that sounds helpful maya well also practice i think the more speeches you say, the easier it will be. I have another question. Actually, if you would recommend any other activities or practices or habits maybe or skills to develop for people who want to have mm. uh, better public speeches. Mm. Yeah. Um... I actually think I, I don't do this, but I think uh, if you take a few singing classes, it could be quite interesting because it can really help you to like uh, sort of uncover a little bit what what your voice actually is and how does it sound and what is it able to do and uh, you know how how far can you go with, with with your voice or how can you shape it. Uh, so that's definitely something that that um, you can try to try to do um, and. Like I presently do a lot of meditation recently, but I don't know if this is going to impact me in any way when I uh, go on the stage or not. I, I haven't uh, tested it yet because I was not um, uh, doing these types of exercises during my year in FYG that much. So I cannot uh, say much about that. Mm. I'm thinking about some other tips. Uh, I, I guess generally like, Mm, it, it might be good just to use any opportunity that you have to, to, to speak in public or also really mm, if you're not, mm, you know, if you're kind of struggling with this, uh, like saying something in public, you can always try with the very easy things like uh, can we open the window, 
you know, that that's like a very easy thing that you know how to say, probably you won't make many mistakes with that. Uh, and if, uh, especially if you're at an event and you're not sure, you're not maybe not there even as a speaker, you're just there as a participant, but you don't know how to kind of start engaging. I think this might be a very easy start because then you already spoke once and then it's actually not so um, shocking to speak again. Okay, let's see if there are any more questions. Uh, I have one actually, another one. Yes. <laughs> um, did you have maybe that year with Katri when you were in the FOG as uh, co-spokesperson? Did you have any lists of words that you should not use? For example, I know that um, women and queer people are tend tend to use a lot of I mean, I mean, because it's mm. also mm. affecting uh, how patriarchy is affecting us, yes, yeah? that we need to re-explain ourselves many times. So um, if you or if you know any um, uh, organizations that has made this kind of list, how to avoid this kind of um, rubbish words, words that don't actually bring any content uh, to the conversation. This is actually super interesting. Uh, I'm not super inspired. We, we didn't do this, but now that uh, you say it, it sounds like something that we should have definitely done. Uh, like, yeah, definitely. Uh, wow. No, we, did, we didn't have any list of words that we're not using. What we did have was, um, so for the campaign, we created basically, we had three big um, areas of our campaign. And that was that we want a Europe that is sustainable, a Europe that is social, and a Europe that is uh, a welcoming and inclusive space uh, for everyone. So these were the kind of the three pillars. And for each of the pillars, we created something that we called the campaign story, which was basically kind of the, the narrative of the campaign, which was like, um, I think it had always about four parts. How do we imagine the future? Who are the ones who are blocking us from the future? What is it or who is it that is getting us closer to that future? And so that way we always knew like, what's the vision? Who is the villain in the story? And who is the hero of the story? So who do we want to celebrate? Who are we fighting against? And what is it that we're fighting for? And we spent, I think, quite a lot of time with the campaign team with rewriting those. Uh, and we also created some campaign slogans on that basis. And I think then it was quite easy to write our speeches because then we just always look at the, the stories and we just took it from there. And we had already a lot of things sort of shaped and, and we also you know then when we were doing Facebook posts or, or anything else we again looked at those stories and that also allowed uh, for our messaging to be like really quite coherent throughout the whole campaign because we we're always basing ourselves on kind of the same narrative that we kind of created um, in the beginning so so we had that and I, I also, I think it's quite, uh, I can be quite honest that we recycled a lot of the speeches. So we, we kind of looked at what we said before and we had like a few paragraphs that, or, you know, some lines that we just really enjoyed. So we like to put them in a lot of our speeches and it was quite nice because then at some point you, you said them already so many times that you become really sharp with them. And uh, that was really nice. So, I'm, I mean, that can be also like a tip, you know, like on, on certain topics, you, you, you might be campaigning for a couple of years of course, narratives might be uh, developing, then you can adjust them, but maybe there might be some uh, messages that uh, you will, that will be just always working. And then if you know you're really sharp with them, uh, like why not, why not use them? It also makes you more recognizable, I guess. Yeah, it's the same messages. Okay, I see there are no more questions. So Elena, you can stop the recording.